percent, or twenty percent of the effort, you get eighty percent of the result. So how much more effort should we take to flatten this curve out? Um, what, how much more can we add in safety measures for public space to actually be safe and be nice? That's the hard thing. And that's the point we're up to right now. In the Netherlands, about 15, 20 years ago, uh, we had the government here in the north who really started a lot of these accidents, uh, in corner before seeing how accident happens, and then trying to think of new ways to deal with that. Uh, and he couldn't figure it out. Every time he thought it was safe, it became unsafe again, he had to do something else. And, well, I don't know, uh, one, maybe one night he just woke up saying, this is wrong, we've got to do it totally differently. So what we're doing, you're treating people like idiots. If you treat people like idiots, they will behave like idiots. Uh, Hans Wollman, he passed away in 2008. Uh, I managed to work with him for a few years, so... Um, but it's radical new philosophy in this. Please sit down, there's plenty of seats over here, so... Uh, the radical new idea is something which, after a while, was called shared space. And it's only a name, please call it anything you like, naked street, living streets. Um, and it meant that instead of adding stuff, you can also take stuff away and give the power back to the people. And with the traffic can also be community based bottom up. Um, shared space is a good thing, it brought us far, and you saw that it reached out of Holland to other countries, and people picked it up in different ways. This is the UK. Um, the UK definition of shared space is a design approach for the reduce, uh, reducing the dominance of car vehicles. That is a well, pretty rigid uh, definition, but it's also a very confined definition. The original definition, which people in Holland still use, is a concept for holistic planning. It has to do with building public space. Traffic is only one of the functions. Uh, it's not about vehicles and columns, it's about individual responsibility of people. So what you see is there's actually different approaches to what shared space is, and you'll experience that in the next presentation as well, because we're seeing it from well, a UK perspective and a US perspective as well. Um, but that thought kind of, well, it's a nice thought that I've worked. Let's look at some of these things to explore that. Um, this is a town in the north of the Netherlands called Harren. The old situation is perfectly like a complete street, so you got your carriageway, uh, the railway delineated, you got separated bicycle facilities, protected even. Uh, crossing location, you have lights so everyone can cross, sidewalks, everything is nice and pretty, just like the engine they want. But it didn't work. It worked from a perfect perspective somewhat, and you had your usual casualties, but that's probably acceptable, I don't know. Uh, but still, this whole town was in decline. No one wanted to go here for shopping. No one wanted to drink a beer or eat an ice cream over here. They just took their car and went to the next town, which had a nice public space. And in 2003, I guess, they changed the street into office. And we're one of the first ones, so they still experimented a little bit and put it. They didn't dare to take the whole roadway out. So still, more or less, it's stretches of asphalt roadway. Um, and the rest is just uh, street brick paper with some trees and uh, street furniture lining up the, the walking zone, the riding zone. Bikes can go anywhere, they don't have to be confined in the center. Um, and the fun thing about it is that they changed the concept around about people not crossing the streets, but cars crossing the square. So every intersection turns into a square, and these cars are hopping over the square. But more or less looks like this. Of course, it's very dangerous. You can only do it with low traffic volumes, is what they say. But this is proven with 12,000 cars per day. Uh, average speed went down for about 15 kph until nine, 29 kilometers, which is how many miles around? I would get it. 29 kilometers. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm not sure. <laughs> 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 Sorry, I'm not sure. 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 Well, less three meters from the field, maybe then just just this, this zones which are more sheltered. Um, so in design, you can do a lot. This is from Germany, uh, Duisburg, Opern plot. So it's the center of Duisburg, which is the town of five hundred thousand. Um, not the biggest one, but also not the tiny one. This site looks like anywhere we have in the U.S. and Canada, but this is the same location as it was built in two thousand eight. It's 16,000 cars a day crossing over this square. Over here is this beautiful opera building, looks like a Greek temple. Then there's this square and the city hall and the library. Um, and the whole facade just brick paper in this gray, slightly lowered a little bit. Um, 
And these cars really go, you can't see it in the picture, they really go 15 kilometers per hour. They drive up to the 50, then drop down to 50 and speed up again. That's a German way, I don't know how it would work like that, but they tend to abide the rules. Um, and other people just cross over anywhere, it works like a charm. And it's really strange to see that in such a big city on such a heavily used arterial road. Final example, I could bring thousands, but I uh, want to show you some European perspective on it. This is Sweden, Nurkoping, uh, built 2004, also one of the first ones. 13,000 cars per day on this intersection. This is the old situation. So roadway, sidewalk, signage, uh, yielding conditions. No traffic sign. Oh, traffic sign is this one. So, sorry. Um, and this is exactly the same spot as it nowadays. You see this Colson Square, with some street figures into it. Um, people moving through crisscross and all ways because it's more or less a rectangle square. The old intersection was taken out. And it really works. In the top view is more impressive. You see people just crisscrossing everywhere. Um, and people pay attention to it. They slow down, as one of the most common features. They slow down so they have time to see each other. And when looking in someone's eyes, you actually know he's going to stop or he's going to run the right away. Um, and everyone go and mingle at slow paces. And that whole concept that people are not just fools, tools, they're actually human beings who actually take care of themselves and the other person. If you, if you trust in that, you can design like this, and you don't have to design uh, like we used to do. Final slide, of course, and not all people are alike. Some like to mingle and mix as much as they can. Other people are more, well, uh, hesitant. Um, if there's a lot of competition, uh, this is in, in the north of the Netherlands again. We did put in, after a while, a zebra crossing, and we did put in some blind um, artificial guidelines to lead up to that. And if they need that, it won't break down your whole design. And you can still play with it. There's not one, one fixed uh, design scheme you have to implement. It's a design process which is different and unique in every time. Just to go back to that original line of uh, well, keywords, the traffic behavior is uniform. Shared space is social behaviors, but people are non uniform. It's different every time. It's unique. It's predictable, but it should be unpredictable. People. Yeah, uh, people um, Take care if it's unpredictable. Um, it's mandatory to have freedom, it's anonymous, but to have eye contact. It's human oriented, it's community based, and bottom up. And it's about what we do together. So, that in a nutshell, in 10 minutes, 11, is what we do with public space, what we do in Europe, where we start to do it. Uh, next presentation is straight ahead, and we do questions afterwards, after us three, one and a half, are about uh, well, open talks, I guess, for the discussion. This is about the perspective from. First, the US, and then the UK. Thank you. My name is Sarah Sabiscus, and I recently graduated from the University of California, Berkeley, with a master's in city planning, although I now am based in Seattle. Um, I'm excited to share my research on shared space with you today. Um, Dick did a great job explaining some of the benefits of shared space, and I'm going to dive into a little bit more on the how to design and implement them. I'll start by uh, briefly outlining my research motivation and design. I'll then um, talk about shared space best practices, challenges to implementation in the US, and my conclusions. So coming out of an internship last summer at Tool Design Group, um, it became apparent that there's a growing interest in shared space among planning and design consultants, um, as well as public agencies, but they're not understood very well. Um, this led me to want to explore how shared space can be applied more broadly in America. This research is intended to help um, practitioners, decision makers, and members of the public uh, determine uh, if it makes sense to build a shared space in their community. I specifically looked at the nuts and bolts of how shared space works, best urban design practices, um, their benefits and challenges, and what regulations, if any, have to change in order to make them possible. To answer these research questions, I conducted an extensive literature review and interviewed 11 practitioners. Um, a quick note, um, I use the term shared streets rather than shared space um, because I think it's clearer um, and more accessible to the general public, so you're going to hear me use both those terms interchangeably today. I want to emphasize um, first that there's uh, no formula for what a shared street should look like. Um, each street is unique and each community has unique needs and desires, um, so there shouldn't be a cookie cutter approach to shared streets. Um, but that said, several best practices emerged from my research um, that seem broadly applicable. 
So different street design features can be used to slow cars down and make the ambiguous street easier for all users to navigate. Um, while these aren't unique to shared streets, um, they're still helpful tools. So first, um, shared streets typically utilize different materials than those found on conventional streets. Uh, the variety of textures and colors um, creates visual interest and intuitively signals to drivers that there's something different about the section of the street, so they should slow down. Second, um, it's important to create what's called edge friction. The more activities and areas of interest happening in the peripheral, peripheral vision of the driver, the more they slow down to absorb that information. So this could include um, benches, trees, bike racks, bollards, and public art. And the closer you bring these activities to the motorist, the more successful the space will be. Similarly, um, there are tricks a street designer can use to make um, the street look even narrower than it is, called visual narrowing, um, which narrows the perceived space that vehicles can drive in, making motorists drive more slowly. Lastly, there's a direct relationship between the size of the street corner radius and the speed of turning cars. Tight corner radii slow down motorists as they turn onto or off of the street and make pedestrians more visible. Another approach which is used on Bell Street in Seattle is to use a city standard driveway ramp. So one of the most important elements necessary for shared streets to be successful is an appropriate um, level of activities on the street edges. Pedestrians are drawn to um, shops, cafes, museums, parks, and other activities. So if a street lacks activities for pedestrians, they're not going to linger. What constitutes an appropriate level of pedestrian density is up for debate and will vary depending on the situation. Um, but one of my interviewees uses a four to one ratio as a general rule of thumb. He believes that um, for a shared street to be successful, you need four pedestrians for every car. Hmm. Another key element is a robust public engagement process. It's essential for decision makers and designers to involve the public at the very beginning of a design process. Um, to think through how to redesign a street and if a shared street makes sense for that community. It's also critical to involve the full range of stakeholders affected by a project. So people like um, shop owners, nearby residents, individuals with disabilities, um, all of um, the unusual suspects as I like to call them should all be involved. So while shared streets lack the formal demarcation of different uses found in conventional streets, um, such as road striping and curbs, um, in order to blur the line between the public realm and the space for cars, it's helpful to offer subtle cues for how people are intended to use the space. So for example, where designers place lampposts, benches, trees, and trash cans provide intuitive cues for where people should and should not drive or sit. Changes in street material texture and color can also have the same effect. So for example, if you look closely at the photo on the left, Folks in the back, I'm sorry if you can't see it. Um, New Road in um, England uses long, light gray stones to mark the car-free pedestrian zone. It's very subtle, but um, that's what that's used for. Informal delineation of zones is also critical for accommodating people who have disabilities. So on that subject, um, shared streets must be designed to comfortably accommodate Americans with disabilities um, and meet ADA requirements. Shared streets are beneficial to pedestrians in wheelchairs um, because the street is flush, um, making wheelchair ramps unnecessary, but they can be a little bit more challenging for blind users. I'll talk a little bit more about ADA later, but a variety of different techniques can be used instead of curbs to signal to blind users the preferred path and the, where the transition between zones happens. So linear drainage channels, corduroy tactile strips, small dark stone pavers, and truncated domes have all been used. Placemaking is also crucial when designing shared streets. Um, I'm sure many of you are familiar with um, techniques like human scale design and sense of enclosure, so I won't go into detail here, um, but at the end of the day, it's about creating lively, welcoming public places where people want to hang out and that speak to the uniqueness and history of the location. Lastly, it's important to create a transition from a conventional asphalt street to shared streets um, that alerts the driver that there's an upcoming change. Drivers need to feel like they're leaving the conventional street system um, and entering into a pedestrian environment in which they're guests. So while there's many benefits to shared streets, uh, they don't come without their challenges. Um, one of the main challenges, which I mentioned earlier, is that blind and deaf individuals have had significant concerns with shared streets, and they must adhere to ADA. 
blind individuals who need to learn to navigate the space, and that can be really challenging. Um, curbs play a large role in how guide dogs are trained, so the lack of curbs can be problematic. Another concern is that a lack of crosswalks could be dangerous for those who can't see or hear oncoming cars. But that said, um, there are lots of examples of shared streets that are successful. Um, there's really no recipe for uh, making shared streets accessible for all users. Um, and for that reason, it's essential to work with local advocacy groups um, and individuals with disabilities from the very beginning of the planning process to find solutions that will work for them. So street designers in places like Point in England were able to alter the design to work for its residents with disabilities <coughs> after conducting a robust public engagement process. Um, though this is something that really needs to be addressed on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, many people also have the perception that shared streets face considerable regulatory challenges, making them difficult to implement in the U.S. So the AASHTO Green Book and Federal Highway Administration's MUTCD um, are often brought up as challenges, but in sum, I found that shared streets are feasible under both these regulations. In case any of you are less familiar with these documents, since we have a wide range of people in the audience today, um, the Green Book provides guidance on how to design the physical geometry of highways and streets. So things like lane widths and quarter radii. Um, and many streets and uh, states and local agencies have adopted it as their design standard. Um, I found that shared streets are feasible because the Green Book is intended to serve as guidance and cities are not obligated to adhere to it under all circumstances. On the other hand, um, the Manual on Uniform Traffic Control Devices, <coughs> MUTCD, um, it serves as the national standard um, for, for traffic control devices installed on streets, highways, bikeways, and private roads that are open to the public. So this includes um, signs, traffic lights, and road markings such as sharrows and surface paint. Um, it's stricter because it's intended to serve as a standard, um, but jurisdictions are able to apply to the FHWA for an exception. Um, or what's called an experiment. So bike boxes and green paint are all fairly standard practices today, but they all started out as experiments. So while it may not be easy to implement shared streets um, under these regulations, I found that it is feasible. Another challenge worth briefly mentioning is that cities regulate street dimensions in order to accommodate emergency vehicles like fire trucks and underground utilities. So it may be necessary to compromise on an ideal street design in order to meet these fire code regulations. A few other challenges worth briefly mentioning are, one, um, when a collision occurs between a motor vehicle and a pedestrian in many European countries, um, the motorist is automatically at fault, um, but that's not the case in the U.S. So motorists are more likely to be reckless and pedestrians are more likely to be cautious in the street. Two, um, minimal before and after research has been conducted on shared streets, which would help make the case to politicians and members of the community. Three, um, strong political will and leadership is necessary. Um, to overcome some of these challenges, and for public perception can also be a major challenge. So despite all of these challenges, shared streets are cropping up all over the U.S. in Seattle, Portland, Cambridge, Cam uh, West Palm Beach, Chicago, and more. I hope my research um, has helped advance our understanding of how shared streets can be applied more broadly in America. Thanks. Sarah and Dick have talked about some of the general how-to and the concepts and the definitions behind. And so I'm going to start talking about specific user groups, specific mode. Um, I looked at uh, cyclists and how they navigated through shared space intersections. So just in brief, um, I'm going to be talking about, well, I'm going to skip most of the definitions because they've already been done. And then some of my research questions, some basic assumptions with the research that I did. So in brief, I'm talking about my PhD research from Portland State University. Um, and then I'll dip into some of the findings and then talk about um, some general discussion and sum it up. So I am going to start with one definition um, I have. And I'm going to step away from this for a second. So let me know if you can hear me. Um, so I'm talking about a path at the scale of the intersection. Okay, instead of talking about the route to get to the intersection, I'm literally talking about how people ride through the intersection itself at that scale. So we have here at Poynton, which has come up a couple of times already, and you've got, this will work, can you guys see, that? Can you see that? So you've got double roundels here, not really roundabouts, but double roundels. And you've got cyclists starting here, and they're all starting at the same point, and I'm giving you three alternative paths that the cyclists can take. So for instance, cyclist A would be more of the vehicular cyclist, right? And they're taking the actual road, the path that a car would take to get from A, 
1 to 2, or AB. Cyclist B is what would be a cyclist on what I'd call a sidewalk or the edge, and they're riding up. They're riding on the sidewalk, they're going all the way up actually to this crosswalk, and then they're skirting the edge again, and they're riding down to the next crosswalk. And then cyclist C is the most efficient of the group, and they're taking the crosswalk and they're cutting all the way down. They're all ending up at the same place. But the path is what I'm using, that is my main variable that I'm looking at here. So I wanted to understand how cyclists were actually riding through, maneuvering, maneuvering through these intersections, and if this shared space design and concept had any influence on that. So this is a picture of one of my study sites um, it's called Elwick Square. It's in Ashford in England, and I'll talk a little bit more about that. But you can see the textured paving and the giant, basically large plaza space that it is, <coughs> with some street furniture and seating and light lighting. So I had to make some assumptions doing this. I did some video um, observations of these intersections, and uh, my assumptions were basically that I think most of you are familiar probably with the general classification of cyclist types. So you've got your fearless uh, all the way down to your no way, no how. Um, and so, excluding the no way, no hows, uh, the more tentative ones, I'm assuming that even if a cyclist is a little more tentative, I'm going to see the full range of cyclist behavior at some point going through this intersection simply because they needed to get through it some way. Mm -hmm. um, and that the, uh, the other assumption is that the path that I observe actually has some relationship to the, the perception that the cyclist takes from that space, how they perceive the space is going to impact it how they ride through the space. And then finally, that each path stands on its own. So even if I saw somebody commuting, and I saw people multiple times during the day doing errands or going out in the morning and coming back in the evening, each intersection, each time they ride through the intersection is a unique event and stands on its own. So like I said, which is real, real brief, I chose to do these in England. Um, in the US, we don't really have any shared space intersections, and I focus specifically on intersections. Uh, England, of course, is the most similar to um, our bike and traffic um, culture in, in the U.S. and Canada versus the Netherlands, which is a completely different level. So I looked at um, two intersections. I did control non-treatment in each site, in each city, as well as shared. Started out in Asher, just south of England, <coughs> then went up to Coventry, um, and then up to Poynton, and did two intersections up there. All right, some aerials. Um, of my study sites. So this is my, I'm not showing you all of my study sites, just a selection of them. This is the intersection in Coventry. This would be the non-treatment the treat, the non one, which is currently been changed into a shared intersection, but you can see it's a traditionally striped uh, intersection. It does have a bike box. Um, it's got marked crosswalks. It's got sidewalk here. This is actually a theater um, with a large paved area with some benches. There's a very busy pedestrian mall just behind this. There was an enormous amount of bus traffic through this intersection and a lot of pedestrian traffic. The next intersection is the simplest one of my sites. This is also in Coventry on the university campus. Um, it's pretty small. And here's the most. And it has some little stone, well, not little stone, some stone bollards at various points along the intersection. So basically, it's flush and it's colored, colored asphalt. And these ends are the number of cyclists I observed running through each intersection. And then we have Elwick Square, that one in Ashford that you saw the, the large image of. You can see the paving. So this is adjacent to a shopping mall. And this is actually a shared use path um, connecting across the railroad <coughs> tracks. And there are benches and seats, benches and trees um, and shrubs. And then there's a seat wall. We got a lot of use. And then finally, Poynton, which I think quite most people are familiar with and you've got your double roundels. Um, this had an enormous amount of large truck traffic. It's sort of a cut through for large trucks, and so that was why they can go to the streets. All right, the fun stuff. <laughs> so these, each line represents a cyclist path. This is, each individual path is a cyclist in the way they rode through. So the colors don't mean anything as the way Excel did it. Um, but what you're seeing here is basically this is a good one to illustrate it. So you have here, you have all of these cyclists. All these cyclists come up to this intersection on the sidewalk. This is the crosswalk right here. They run through the crosswalk, and then they break out through here. So these are all broken down by direction, because if I put them all overlaid on the same <coughs> image, it's just a tangled mess. And you can see some of the other directions, how that impacts the way people navigate. 
So Coventry, um, this is the first of the shared, and you can really see how much people can spread out. So this would be what I'd consider the vehicular cyclists, riding straight through here. And then you get some people up on the sidewalk riding all the way up the crosswalk and back again. Some people are going to go not quite to the crosswalk, but almost, and I call that veering, and there's levels of gradation on that. I think this one really points out the extent to what a lot of people do to avoid riding through the intersection itself. So you have this person who started out here and rode all the way along the sidewalk, this is a pub by the way, all the way along the sidewalk to the crosswalk here, and then all the way down here, all the way to this crosswalk, and then across the street. So really going out of their way to avoid riding through the center of the street. Similarly in Elwick, um, you can see the variations here. You've got these people really hugging this wall to get to this crosswalk. But when you get to this section, depending on where people are going, you get some more fanning out and people more comfortable to go through versus the same group, you know, really hugging to get to the crosswalk. So you get a variety of, of rider confidence levels, I think. And then pointing, again, you're seeing the same patterns move to the spaces. You're going to get your vehicular cyclists adhering strictly through like they were driving. Um, and there's a large contingency in England, I found, that do this. And then you get those that are going to be clinging to the sides, riding along the edge, um, more comfort, um, hitting the crosswalks and hitting adjacent to the buildings. So that you can see the actual numbers, um, there really was a large percentage of cyclists that touched upon the sidewalk or the crosswalk at some point during their path across the intersection. Sometimes they hit it twice, I don't count them twice, but some people hit every crosswalk in the intersection practically. Um, and it depends on the intersection design, but you're going to see that it more in some than others. For instance, in Elwick Square, it's up to 88%. Uh, but in the shared simple one, you have to say what the different colored bars are. Sure. It's hard to read. Yeah. Okay, so this one, these are purple, the light purple mob, that is sidewalk use. So it's going up to 88% up here and down to 40 on here there, I think it's 47%. So you see the range, and this is this is the control, this is the non-treatment, okay? So you can see that even in the non-treatment, they're up in the 60% using the sidewalk. And the magenta is the crosswalk use. So this is the percentage of riders that went through the crosswalks. And then, and both of these percentages, uh, crosswalk and sidewalk use, were significant. And as I mentioned, veering, um, those were not. So that was a little more of a subjective measure where cyclists rode towards the crosswalk, but they didn't actually ride in the crosswalk. So it's, it's a deviation of the path to get there. Did that make sense? Can you guys see that now? So generally what I'm finding is that um, there's no... What's happening is that sidewalks are using the edges and the side... Um, cyclists are using the edges and the sidewalks in both spaces, the non-treatment and the treatment. Um, Is that time? Okay, yes, moving on. So I started to see this, for instance, the crosswalk and the veering as a type of safe haven instead of just a connector. It's more than that. So this lateral movement that a lot of cyclists are doing is almost like a pressure relief zone. So by giving them or allowing them that space, they can ride farther out. That gives them that flexibility that they might want um, to do that. And that's seen in the increased deviation of their paths, as you can see in some of these illustrations. Uh, so it also, I think, really demonstrates the flexibility and the versatility of a bicycle and the fact that they can ride in all of these spaces when that space is provided for them. I think it also demonstrates for some riders that reluctance to necessarily ride the way that the shared space concept would hope, right? But by providing that space for them, that lateral edge space, instead of something really constricted like we traditionally have, you give them more options is the way, is the way I'm seeing that. And, uh, that is all I have for you. Thank you. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, the conflicts were really minimal. They just, it wasn't much of an issue at all. Okay. Thank you. Right up here in front, this side. Hi, uh, my name is Lee from the county of Kauai, and uh, I'm curious about a lot of the examples that you showed seem to still show differentiation between pedestrian space, crosswalks and intersections. I was always thinking of a shared street as just a total mix of the entire space. And like your example of bicyclists moved over to the sidewalk, so that implies they're still in some of these 
images show separation, but I'm curious if you could give some examples of just complete mixing of all uses across without that differentiation. And, and what makes that successful? Um, I would say that uh, shared space is not a fixed thing, it's a bandwidth. It's either super conventional, super shared space, and a big, large gray area in between. And well, we showed in a couple of videos while we're talking through this. Situations differ per culture, per, per country. Uh, this is Holland, this is the UK, and the US example. Germany, Sweden, and Belgium do a lot of this stuff. And every country is looking for their own optimal mix in their own situation. For instance, this one, this is a fully shared, like we call the, the, the general naked streets. There's no um, delineation or separation or zoning whatsoever. Um, some, as, as traffic volumes, tend to be higher or and well, the design group more or less thinks they need more guidance. You can still separate a little bit more because of the street furniture or, or the original where the curb fills share space with the curb or some curb, I don't know. Um, but it's always, in each situation, looking for the optimal mix. Um, and it's about um, looking for what works, actually, um, instead of going for one fixed design in a super conventional way. Does that answer the question a little? Well, I guess I'm wondering what would be some of the criteria that you would use to determine um, recognizing this range? Like, yeah. when would it be appropriate to just do a complete mix? I would say that a, a shared space is always out of balance. Um, it's always about the balance between place function and the flow function. So you can have a super tiny village with only one pub and one grocery store and a really low volume street and that's more or less balanced out so you can do a shared space over there and if the place function is strong enough you can leave, it, leave away the, uh, the separation the zoning or because if you do a heavily used arterial road but there's also a lot of big buildings and a German example that's also the right balance but as soon as one of these is stronger especially if the traffic function is stronger you, and you do a naked street to actually make a non-accessible space. So in that case, I would guide them. Some of the Leeward examples show at least a rudimentary, very subtle roadway, uh, nothing like the curbstone and asphalt and then sidewalks, but still one of the contours of something. Uh, so that balance is what we're looking for. And there's not, there's not like this, this fixed amount of ADA, ADT with which you have to separate or have to always about searching for that balance. Uh, it's about best practices to see what works over there and what works over here. I know we want to move on.